investigation widely discussed across the country. Actor Jesse Smollett claimed he was assaulted by two masked men, but now Chicago police say they no longer consider him a victim in this case. This is Outnumbered, and I'm Melissa Francis here today, the host of Kennedy on the Fox Business Network. Kennedy, reporter for Fox News headline 24-7, Carly Shimkus. Fox News contributor and national security analyst Morgan Ortegas, and on the couch, editor in chief of the Daily Caller News Foundation, Christopher Bedford. <laughs> there you go. We're going to hop right to it. Police releasing two Nigerian brothers that they briefly held for questioning in the reported attack against Smollett. And Chicago police now say the quote tra trajectory of the investigation has shifted. Mike Tobin is live in Chicago with the latest, Mike. Amelis, I just got a statement from Smollett's team. Let me read it to you uh, verbatim. There are no plans for Jesse Smollett to meet with Chicago police today. Any news reports suggesting otherwise are inaccurate. That is in reference to a uh, report that ran in the Chicago Sun-Times today, uh, this morning, saying that he might submit to this interview that police are requesting. It goes on to say Smollett's attorneys will keep an active dialogue going with Chicago police on his behalf. We have no further comment today. Now, Smollett's team has been saying that he is further victimized by the claims that he staged his own attack. Over the weekend, police told me that uh, Smollett is no longer considered a victim in this case. They stopped short of saying that he is a suspect. What police did say is that they have new information and want to bring Smollett in and for more questioning. And this follows police detaining and interrogating two brothers from Nigeria. Official sources say the two men cooperated. Evidence came out of those interrogations that said the brothers should go free. The anonymous police sources said the two men were paid by Smollett to stage the attack. They even rehearsed it. Police have, uh, have things, according to the anonymous sources, like a receipt for the rope that was put around Smollett's neck. Now, as far away as Los Angeles, people have, re have reached the conclusion that Smollett made all this up and they're angry. For Smollett to say that he was a victim of racism and hate crime, and we believe that it's a lie, certainly is an injustice to those true victims of racism and hate crimes. There has been some discussion that this case will go to the grand jury. When I press police about that question, they go to what has now become a familiar refrain. They want to bring Smollett in for the follow-up interview. After that, the question about the grand jury can be answered. Guys? Mike Tobin, thank you. In the meantime, new questions about the initial reaction to the case. Many top Democrats seem to immediately take Smollett's allegations as fact. Some even sought to blame President Trump. Here's Democratic Congresswoman Maxine Waters reacting on the day of the alleged incident. We have to understand this is happening for a reason. It's coming from the President of the United States. He's dog whistling every day. He's separating and dividing, and he is basically emboldening those folks who feel this way. Hmm. Hmm. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, in this now-deleted tweet, wrote, The racist, homophobic attack on Smollett is an affront to our humanity. No one should be attacked for who they are or whom they love. Senator and 2020 candidate Kamala Harris tweeted that the attack was an attempted, quote, modern-day lynching. Hmm. Fellow 2020 candidate Senator Cory Booker used the same term to describe the attack, but here's what he's saying now. The information is still coming out, and I'm going to withhold until all the information actually comes out. But since 9-11, the majority of the terrorist attacks on our soil, on our soil have been right-wing terrorist attacks. Hmm. All right. Um, Chris, it... The jumping to conclusions. I mean, you take someone at their word when they say that they've been a victim of a crime. That seems logical enough. But to then go to that next extent, ec the next extent where you're blaming the president. I don't know your, your, your thoughts on sort of like the hyper pile on. Well, what, what blew me away about this attack was that it didn't really seem very believable. To begin with, I mean, if you hear it, and it shows you the frame of mind that a lot of these folks are in, in the media and in politics, that they actually think that it seems likely that there are bands of 
white rednecks roaming Chicago at 2 a.m. with nooses and bleach yelling, this is MAGA country, and attacking random people. That would be an incredibly uh, hokey kind of television show. That would be, nobody would watch that kind of drama. But, and but, they all jumped on it and said, of course, yeah, that sounds right. That's what Trump supporters do. But, but moving on to the part where you're blaming the president for having created an environment where that happened, Kennedy, I mean, it's so somebody comes out and they say they were a victim of something. Yeah. You, I mean, to come out and make a statement, at first you're going to believe them and, and look into it and that sort of thing and treat them with respect out of the gate no matter what. And you don't blame anyone for doing that in this case, for sure. But kind of that next level where you had, you know, Maxine Waters, for example, saying this is the attitude. It starts at the top. He's dividing us. Look what happened. Well, as you, you look at Maxine Waters and you say, OK, well, what are you doing to bring us together? What are you doing to, to bridge the divide? Because it, there is a divide in this country, and there is real racism. But when, when something like this happens, you know, it's, it's absolutely true. It diminishes the claims of other people who come forward and, and people who are victims of uh, legitimate, horrific acts and intentions. But, you know, you look at, you have to go back to the beginning and say, what motivated, if, if this was in fact a total fraud, and he paid this pair of brothers that he met on the set of Empire uh, to, you know, perpetrate this fake crime, what is the motivation? Yeah. And it's, it's to get people all riled up, but he didn't think a few steps down the road and that Chicago PD might actually have detectives and investigators who are going to go out and investigate his claims and take them very seriously mm -hmm. and, and really start to parse them. And the other thing, you know, and there was some talk that he was worried he was being written off of Empire and wanted to make a big splash. He says that the men who attacked him were white and clearly white, even though they were wearing face masks. And if that's the case, then these Nigerian brothers are that convincing of actors, then oh. they should replace Jesse Smollett on the show. <laughs> Carly, uh, 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 Chris Steyerwalt said earlier today, you know, that the whole thing about this age that we're in is that it's so much easier to be stupid faster. On because, social media. Well, you have social media, you have instant reaction. Yeah. People can put things out and, and they feel the need to dive into the divide. And I think now we're sort of getting that instant reaction on the other side where a lot of uh, conservatives on Twitter are sort of pointing and laughing at Democrats. And I don't um, think it's wrong for Democratic politicians to condemn what they thought was a hate crime at the time. Um, I just rewatched the interview that he did with Robin Roberts, and he said, you do such a disservice when you lie about things like this. He said that. Yeah. And if this turned out to be false, how the heck was anybody supposed to know? So you sort of have to let people be people and believe certain things yeah. like this. Well, so maybe it's up to the media to be more responsible. I mean, for yes. average people are going to pile on. You have somebody like, so April Ryan, for example, um, tweeting this attack on Jesse Smollett as a hate crime and should be treated as such. I mean, for us, at least, we've been through the mill before and should show a little bit more respect. And, and I think you're right about that, where there is a difference between a politician, somebody asking a politician for, for their feedback on a story, and and a, a journalist jumping to a conclusion when it's their responsibility to report the facts. Yeah, I think picking up on what you said, and I, I agree that the instinct to call out something that is perceived to be evil is, is a good and noble instinct, right? When we all yeah. say something, the problem is, and I, I think what the difference here in this situation is instead of just calling out something that was evil, uh, people jumped to, to lump it directly, right, to, yeah. to, to, uh, to direct it at President yeah, Trump. That's and I think that's the difference here is I do think when we all see evil, when we all see racism and, 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 and things that are unconscionable, we should call it out, where I think, uh, as Chris said earlier that you alluded to, where I think everyone needs to take a, a deep breath, is, is directly linking these things to a president or to, you know, the Democrat Party, to whatever right. political party. Um, and I think that's, you know, the main thing that we're all learning here as it relates to the Covington case as well, or as it relates to everything that we're seeing going on in Virginia on a daily basis, uh, you know, with the top three elected officials there. You have to sort of take a deep breath and say, if this, if this happened, it's terrible, but let's not attribute things to people that when we don't have the facts of the case. Go ahead, and you, you see things that are evil in these hate crimes. You see men dragged behind trucks. You see people attacked or denied jobs or denied a place to live. What you don't see are Donald Trump supporters in red hats saying, this is MAGA country while attacking people in the middle of the night. That's that would have been hokey 1930s Batman comic. I mean, that's it's not it's a cartoon villain. And for so many people to obvious to just jump on board and say, that's exactly what's going on. This is a modern day lynching. They should they should have stepped back and said, hold on this.
This seems kind of outlandish. True, but uh, the big the big takeaway from all this is that we can't judge a situation until we have all the facts on the table, and we still True. don't have and all the facts. And journalists who are covering it have to use words like. Alleged. Alleged. And, you know, but you're right about Nancy Pelosi's statement. The second half of her statement is absolutely true. No one should be attacked for what they are or who they love. And, and that, that is a, a universal truth, uh, especially now. And we hope that the world is getting better and not worse. Yeah. And, you know, we, we have to stop acting like this is the absolute worst time in American history. Yeah, and I think you're right, Kennedy. The instinct to, to demonize each other and to think the worst of each other is something that I think is just vitriolic in today's politics. And and, and everybody is guilty of doing it. And, and instead, you know, instead of thinking the worst of people who support the president or the worst of people that support Nancy Pelosi, can we all get back to the point of remembering that we're Americans and we may have a fundamental disagreement on policy and how we get where we think America needs to be? But that doesn't mean each other are inherently evil. I, this is I all Twitter's I, fault. It's all Twitter's <laughs> fault. It really is. Um, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I don't know. Either way, I have compassion for someone. And I, I know that this annoys people. But if he did make it up, I still feel really sorry for him. Because he's got it screw loose. Like something obviously is, is well, going on. It is it. sad. I mean, it's sad both ways. If it's true, it's sad. If it's not true, But it boils true, down to the individual. Sad. It's not about groups. And it's not well, about being that's activated. It's, yeah. that's it's the point. one it's person who made a, a series apparently at this point we're learning a series of, of really bad True. choices yeah. and and that's what it, it goes back to and it, it, it speaks to his character and you know sure we may be in a time where the political tenor is is so loud and, and it feels so mean and unsustainable but that still goes back to the individual and his reaction and yeah. intent. maybe you could suppress that urge to say see this is exactly what I was telling you about <laughs> and then it goes to whatever larger point people were trying to make and now you see it on the other side like you said that now you see See, like, where, you know, on the right, they're piling on exactly. saying this is, you know, we're going to blame, blame the president for everything. In the end, the police will tell us what actually happened. And, you know, then we'll know. But maybe we could all. I think perpetrators in these cases where, where this has happened in the past tend to think that they're bringing sympathy to the to the larger cause. And actually, the when this I... happens, the perpetrators are actually looking for attention for themselves. I'm not saying that's what's going yeah, on there. We don't know. And they do the we, opposite we, of bringing sympathy. The police sympathy will tell us, as you said. Cause. But yeah, but this yeah. is not this is Good not point. a new phenomenon in law enforcement. All right, new calls for the Democratic chairman of the House Intelligence Committee to recuse himself from his committee's Russia investigation as questions are raised over his meeting with one of the men behind the Steele dossier. We'll debate that. Plus, we're watching new protests outside the White House against the president's declaration of a national emergency as there's growing legal and political challenges to the plan. What's the way forward for President Trump and the country? Well, it is heating up new protests outside the White House against the president's national emergency declaration amid escalating legal challenges to his efforts to help secure funding for a wall on the southern border. Senior advisor to the president, Stephen Miller, on Fox News Sunday, predicting a huge portion of the wall will be built. What the president was saying is, is that like past presidents, he could choose to ignore this crisis, choose to ignore this emergency as others have, but that's not what he's going to do. Well, you're going to see probably a couple hundred miles in time um, to, I would say, by the end of the next appropriation cycle. So by the end of this year, by the end of, hundreds you know, of miles? Next fiscal year, one more after this. Okay, so by September of 2020, right, right in the middle of the presidential campaign. <laughs> Meantime, the first lawsuit challenging the emergency declaration has been filed by liberal advocacy group Public Citizen and California Attorney General Javier Becerra. He says he's working with several other states to mount another legal challenge, quote, imminently. Let's take a look. A number of states and certainly Americans will be harmed and we're all going to be prepared. He himself said it. He did not need to announce or declare a crisis. He did not have to call this an emergency. He has also said he knows he's going to lose in court. Well, that's fine. Even multiple Republicans in the House and Senate object to the national emergency declaration. Among them, border state Republican Congressman Will Hurd. Our government was designed for the, the most ultimate power, the power of the purse, to reside within Congress. And we shouldn't have an executive, I don't care if it's Republican or Democrat, that tries to get around Congress with this national emergency. I'm always open to making sure that Congress takes back some of its power as a co-equal branch of government. 
Amen. What a wonderful time for that discussion and uh, revisiting the That's Constitution. Right Will Hurd also brought up some great points, Chris, about uh, eminent domain in Texas and how thousands of ranchers have uh, plots of land that will indeed be ripe for a government taking. And they will fight the federal government in court over that. The Republicans in Congress are kind of funny on this because they're always pushing back and saying the Congress needs to assert itself against the executive. But every time they come into power, usually the first thing they cut is their own congressional budgets. Mm -hmm. John Boehner cut Congress's budget and then said, we'll deal with the executive later. It's no surprise that everyone who's in Congress in their mid-20s, maybe their first or second job, where you're fighting career employees and they're going to beat them most of the time. But President Trump seems to have learned his lesson on the uh, earlier immigration ban rollouts and things like that. Our legal analyst at the News Foundation, Kevin Daly, said that by focusing on building walls in Texas uh -huh. first and using congressional money that's already been appropriated and using money from the Treasury that's already been seized, he's going to severely limit the amount of people who have uh, the ability to bring a lawsuit against him to the Fifth Circuit or maybe to Washington, D.C.'s more moderate circuit. And that's going to make it so that be by the time California really has standing to sue him, uh -huh. it's going to be, he's going to have actually built, like Stephen Miller said, a lot of this wall. Well, uh, Hawaii is jumping in as well because uh, they've got some tremendous issues with their porous borders. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was really surprised to see that Hawaii being lumped in with uh, Oregon and California. It's like, you, know, you, you never get them. <laughs> you know, what's interesting is this is being compared a lot to President Obama's move as it relates to DACA. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not a lawyer, but I did talk to a few people this morning to try to get a better understanding of the difference between when uh, President Obama made the DACA move versus uh, President Trump's national emergency move. And one of the points that was made is, is that DACA, Republicans made, was actually uh, abuse of prosecu prosecutorial discretion. That's a long word for a Monday. But but essentially, a prosecutor can say, I'm not going to prosecute you, Melissa, because you're here illegally, and I'm just going to choose not to use my resources to do that. There's a difference between that versus saying, Melissa, not only am I not going to prosecute you, I'm going to confer legal status on you ver versus via an executive order. And so the president and his team will point to a number of times that plenty of things have been, uh, have been approved via a national emergency. Um, and and that's that's, I think, where they're going to parse the difference between what President Obama did and what President Trump has done. Well, interesting. It's, it's really interesting because so much more power uh, is going to shift to the Supreme Court in, in terms yeah. of, of their, if it does make its way to the Supreme Court, and, and it, that will become critical for liberals and conservatives because conservatives will see that the sky is falling, the next president has to be a Democrat in order to rebalance the court because the president is saying no matter what the legal challenges are, it'll go to the Ninth Circuit, then the appellate court will lose, will lose, then it'll go to the Supreme Court and we will win because there is a conservative majority. Um, it, it Although I'm not totally sure that he's right about that. I mean, he's done a bunch of things along the way to kind of undermine his own case. I mean, when he stood there and said, I don't really need to do this, you're like, yikes. Um, <laughs> yeah. That was... It does sort of not, lessen the emergency part of it. Yeah, it, it, it does make it tough. I mean, other legal experts have said it matters so much more what he writes versus what he says. And, of course, in that very long press conference, he did say almost everything. So, you know, you could kind of put something into every little basket there. But I don't... I mean, I just... I don't don't know that his confidence at the Supreme Court level again I'm not a lawyer either it just it doesn't necessarily seem to me like that it, that's that is for sure the case and he had a bunch of avenues to go and it was one that one piece of money that he wanted for this that, it was only a few of those billions that he was putting together of those eight that depended on calling it a national emergency and, and speaking of the legality and Kennedy something that you brought up uh, was uh, Will Hurd talking about the like, 1,000 farmers that may that could stand to lose land there are still people in court over the 2006 Secure Fence Act that are trying to figure out money that yeah, they those are eminent owed. You're absolutely right. Those eminent domain cases can take a long time. Uh, absolutely. So the, the legality of all this is going to take a long time, and that wall is there, so you can still build a wall on land even when you're still working out the money aspect of it. I just don't think that President Trump needed to do this. I mean... The, 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 the proposal was bad, and he signed a bad plan, but he could still, he's the ultimate spin master. He could have spun it into a win. 55 new miles of, of fencing, 120 miles of fencing that we're going to uh, make better. Bolster. More yeah. money yeah. for judges. Exactly. Yeah. $3 billion that he could have used that doesn't need well, a national Congress, emergency if, to if obtain. If Congress wants to take their power back, 
then why don't you figure out what the holes are in the uh, the theoretical immigration fence and and fix yeah. those and and figure out how many people right. need to come into this right. country and and work legally and and make the system better so Beto O'Rourke doesn't have to callous but, his poor hands by tearing the fence down himself. And Congress has yes. no issue, no interest in solving this problem. Republicans would rather see it in their rearview mirror. They think it's a hot button issue that's not going to help them. Uh, Democrats are completely against it. They're not willing to solve the dreamer issue like when President Trump suggested that last. Mm -hmm. And they're certainly not willing to provide more funds for this wall. So he's dealing with a Congress that has zero interest and zero motivation to try and fix this. But it's too bad they don't want to use that as an opportunity to seize back their power, like you said. That would be great. Yeah, do your job. Uh, do your job. Fact, stop complaining right. about it. Or not, you. Democrats divided <laughs> over Amazon, scuttling plans to build a second headquarters in New York City and taking thousands of jobs with them. Can the Dems unite on this issue heading into 2020, or do they hate money? Plus, President Trump now accusing former FBI acting director Andrew McCabe and Deputy AG Rod Rosenstein of pursuing an, quote, illegal and treasonous plot against his presidency. This after McCabe's explosive 60 Minutes interview. We've got all the details ahead of today right here. We talked about um, why the president had insisted on firing the director. And in the context of that conversation, the deputy attorney general offered to wear a wire into the White House. New reaction to explosive new claims from former acting FBI Director Andrew McCabe. McCabe saying the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein was serious about secretly recording President Trump and discussed removing the president from office. Watch this. The Deputy Attorney General offered to wear a wire into the White House. He said, I never get searched when I go into the White House. I could easily wear a recording device. They wouldn't know it was there. Now, he was not joking. He was absolutely serious. And in fact, he brought it up in the next meeting we had. Today, President Trump tweeting, wow, so many lies by disgraced acting FBI director Andrew McCabe. He was fired for lying. And now his story gets even more deranged. He and Rod Rosenstein, who was hired by Jeff Sessions, another beauty, <laughs> looked like they were planning a very <laughs> illegal act and got caught. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Lindsey Graham spoke before the McCabe interview aired, Graham saying that he plans to subpoena McCabe and Rosenstein unless they voluntarily agree to testify. I'm sure they will. Watch this. We're a democracy. People enforce the law, can't take it in their own hands. And was this an attempted bureaucratic coup? I don't know. I don't know who's telling the truth. I know Rosenstein's uh, vehemently denied it, but we're going to get to the bottom of it. So, Chris, just focusing in on what new we learned by watching the interview last night versus the stuff we knew before. So I was shocked by the way he really categorized the whole thing as like it was all Rod Rosenstein's idea. Like he was yeah. sort of like when he, he when he do you notice that too? Yes, when somebody watching, was it, getting thrown under the bus. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was like, was like he's scary. like, I walked into this room and he brings up this yep. idea. And even when Scott Pelley said to him, like, you know, what were you thinking? And he goes, I was thinking, how did I get here? You know, like he's this passive person who is a fly on the wall while Rod Rosenstein was cooking up this scheme to go and, you know, record the president and get him out of office. I mean, what, what that was, you were thinking similar thoughts? Uh, absolutely. What, why, when I had the same thought as you when I was watching it last night. I said, this is, uh, it, it almost distracted from the book because yeah. it was clearly such a premeditated effort for whatever reason. I don't know why, but it was clearly McCabe had decided that he wanted to go after Rosenstein. and yeah. was going to make it an issue there. I think, you know, Rosenstein came out and, and said they mischaracterized the meeting. Right. And so I there was, was a lot of fighting between the two of them. So, you know, we don't know who was telling the truth. But here you have uh, the number two of the FBI, who was, of course, fired and, and has been accused of the, uh, from the IG, from uh, within the FBI, of having uh, perhaps told myths, you know, not told the truth about his leaks to the media. And then you have the number two of the DOJ essentially giving, you know, com opposite stories and com accusing each other of lying, essentially. I mean, that's what's going on here. We have number two at FBI, number two of DOJ saying yeah. that guy's lying. That's yeah. a bad situation for our FBI and our Department of Justice to be in. We can't sugarcoat that. Yeah, Chris, I mean, one of the other things I thought was, was really interesting was that he kept not being specific about why. 
they wanted to remove the president. Like, what was the problem? You know, they talked about. He's icky. He, yeah, he, he said like. Um, <laughs> he tweets. Yeah. Gross. It was like we were saying this president, his capacity, his intent, but he didn't say, you know, because we thought he was colluding with Russia. He just kept saying, you know, like here we were in this wide ranging conversation about removing the president, but not really like why, why did he need, why, why the 25th Amendment? Why didn't he need to be removed? Did you, did you notice that or? I, the, the whole thing is, it's insane. And it, it's really scary that that's how people who are really high up in these critical departments are operating surreptitiously. And uh, it, it's awful. It's not okay. And there has to be some accountability. The accountability can't just be you have two guys who are really mad at each other now, so they're saying mean things, trying to contradict yeah. the other and ruin the other's reputation. That is not accountability. This cannot happen. And I know everyone uh, makes fun of limited government uh, libertarians. Oh, no. Liberty-minded who want to pare down the scope of the surveillance state, but this is why: because people have so much power concentrate, mm -hmm. concentrated in so few humans that they really feel emboldened to, to operate this way, and it is wrong. It is not how this country should operate, regardless of who the president is. And, and if this was a TV show, it could have been written by Smollett. I mean, it's a hokey script again. Where do our FBI agents learn how to act? Where they're going to say, <clears throat> "All right, let's wear a wire into the White House. Let's say it's true." And then what are they going to do? None of them have the power to remove the president. Their plan was to get Vice President Mike Pence to remove President Trump if they wore a wire. If this is true at all, it shows you that our FBI at the top is not as smart as our FBI rank and file. But don't you think the acting FBI director should have, at that point, been so outraged by uh, the idea, the suggestions? Sessions? I mean, you were talking about Iraq. No, no, I'm talking about McCabe. Like remember, no, this McCabe, also, this no, also the FBI the... director. McCabe oh, sorry, was the acting right. FBI sorry. director, but he should have gone, hell no, we're I not going it's... to remove the president via the 25th Amendment. Instead of a sure, we don't fault. like him. He does things that, that we think yeah. are untoward and gross and wrong, yeah. but that is not grounds for, you know, us, just a few guys in a room removing the but president. But don't forget, this went to the general counsel uh, as well. That's what Rosenstein said last night. So it wasn't just the people in the room. It wasn't, you know, one person said, as a joke, Rosenstein apparently went, went to and told him. went and yeah. told to the gen Baker. general, yeah, the general counsel. So there was a lot of people that were in on this discussion for it to be. Harley, and, yeah, and if I could, it, uh, my antennas went up twice during this conversation. It was one time when he was asked, "When did the 25th Amendment conversation come up?" And he said he can't remember. Mm, you right. can't remember when that happened. That's right. like a flash forward to when the hearings are going to start. I'm sure right. that's going to be his answer for a lot of things. And also, when he started the obstruction of justice um, charge. He said it was because if he um, was going to get fired, he wanted to make sure that none of these things went away. But that's not how this works, as I'm sure you can attest to. Investigations just don't go away because somebody gets fired, and he knows that. So for him to, to try and sell that to the American people is a big question as well, and I think we need some clarification on that point. Well, I guess I, and, and that begs the question, will we get clarification? Because that's how we started this segment, talking about the idea that they want to have